that have been proclaimed by Jesus and the apostles. And that's his aim, that you would not depart from their teaching. The next thing that is there, that you would be established and firm. And the next bit is not moved from the hope that's held out in the gospel. So established and firm, not moved. <coughs> from the hope. Our hope is in the faith, which is in the truth. Our, our, our hope is in God. Don't have hope in hope. Don't have faith in faith. You have hope and faith in God and in the words of God. So, obviously, the hope is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, the subject of hope appears in the book of Colossians in chapter 1 three times. Uh, we see in the beginning, we looked at a last week, that um, we need to stand firm in the hope that we have in heaven. Amen. There is a heavenly hope. And we need to, as we live the Christian life, so that we're not moved from the faith, so that we don't pull back and get discouraged and get defeated by the powers of darkness. We need hope, but we need our hope firmly established as the hope that we have that is stored up for us in heaven. And, and, the, and the gospel tells us of the hope we have for eternal life. The hope that we have to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. Uh, the hope that when we die, it is not the end. But there, this is just the beginning, actually. And, um, and then here we have the hope is described to us in the gospel. So we see the hope is stored for us in heaven. We need that hope placed there. And then as we study the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ... There's hope in that message. And then later we're going to see Jesus Christ himself is the hope of glory in your heart. So it's actually a lie to believe as a Christian you are in a hopeless situation. That you are without hope. Because when you're a Christian, Jesus Christ by his spirit comes to dwell in you. God dwells in you. We saw that Last week, the very power of God that raised Jesus from the dead, the very power of God that seated Jesus at the right hand of the Father above demonic powers and principalities, it says in Ephesians 1, that same power is in you who believe in Jesus. The power to raise the dead, the power that would raise us above demonic powers and sit us on a throne next to Jesus above demonic powers. And Paul's saying, I pray for you Always that God would open your eyes to see the truth of this power that's in you, the belief. And so this power that's with us, we have this hope in us. Jesus Christ is the hope of glory. By the way, the hope that's stored up for us in heaven is Jesus. And all that we have in Jesus and through Jesus. And the gospel is the message of Jesus. That's where our hope is found. So Paul is saying that his goal in all of his prayers... And all of his ministry for the people in the church is that they would continue in the faith because out of the faith they get this hope that they would not depart from it, but they would be established, firm and strong in the hope and in the faith and not defeated and that they get this hope from the gospel. So that's the first point that we look at here. He says that I, Paul, have been made a servant of this gospel. And I want you to know, if you are a true born-again believer this morning, you are commissioned like Paul to be a servant or a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we need to stand firm, established in the gospel of Jesus Christ, not moved from that message. And we must actually become not just the messengers, but we must become the message. That we would eat of the book, so to speak, and then what we eat today walks and talks in us tomorrow. That by faith we eat and drink of Christ until we walk and talk Christ. 
And so that is his goal. Paul is saying uh, that he's been commissioned as a minister of the gospel. Now, verse 24, he says, Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Now, this is a very interesting subject. It's called the sufferings of Christ. You know, if you go off and do something stupid in life and you sin, and as a result of your sin you suffer, that's not the sufferings of Christ. That's called the sufferings from being stupid and playing with sin. The sufferings of Christ is what happens to righteous people making a righteous stand in the truth. And they suffer for what is right and what is good. That's the sufferings of Christ. And they're suffering for the sake of Christ and the sake of Christ's kingdom. So I've met many Christians over the years and they've done stupid things in life that have caused them to get depressed and upset and, and, and lose hope. And, you know, but they made stupid make mistakes. And then they go, I'm suffering for Jesus. That's not suffering for Jesus. You need to repent and get fixed up. But the suffering for Jesus is when, when you are suffering for doing right. You're speaking the truth. And we live increasingly in a world where truth is not politically correct. Where truth is not popular. And you stand for the truth and you declare the truth. And people will say that you're full of hate or you're evil or you're vilifying. And so, this is the sufferings of Christ. Now, <clears throat> Paul is making an interesting statement. As a minister of the gospel, as a servant of Jesus Christ, he's filling up in his body what's lacking in regards to Christ's affliction. What does that mean? Well, I want you to know what it doesn't mean. You know, Jesus' work on the cross, Jesus fully finished his work. He fully accomplished uh, the, the, the work that he needed to do. He said, it is finished. It is done. And so the work that is required for our salvation eternal is done at the cross. But what Paul is talking about, and as we go through what he says later, it explains it a bit more. It's kind of like this. Again, I'll just draw a picture for the sake of, if you're thinking pictures like me, I'm a picture person. Okay, so just imagine this is the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He doesn't have to do anything else. It's done. We can't do anything to add to Jesus' finished work on the cross. Okay, But what Paul is talking about to make up or to fill up in his flesh what's lacking in the afflictions of Christ, in order for the finished work of Jesus Christ, which is a heavenly eternal reality, to become an earthly experiential reality, in order for what Jesus started at the cross to be finished, the goal of what Jesus did on the cross to be finished, there has to be messengers of Christ that would proclaim who Christ is, what Christ has done, and what Christ is going to do. And so by Paul now being a messenger and a representative of Christ, he's fulfilling the work that Christ started at the cross. Do you understand what I'm saying? Jesus' personal work is done. It's finished. But in order for that work to be appropriated or for that work to actually accomplish its goal in people's lives, there needs to be people like us that would represent Jesus, that would preach and share about Jesus, introduce people to Jesus. And then through us, that work is being fulfilled, what Jesus started on the cross. But more than that, he's saying this, that to do this, there is suffering. That to really be a witness for Jesus, to stand for His truth and His justice, because the world has many definitions of truth and justice, you know, but it's not God's definition. For us to stand for God's definition of truth and justice, for us to proclaim without any compromise the message of Jesus Christ, there are people who will oppose us. Jesus Himself said, if they hate me, they'll hate you also. You know, and uh, a servant is not above his master. If they hated me, they'll hate you too. And so, in proclaiming the gospel, there is a certain level of self-sacrifice required. Yeah. We, Jesus says you need to count the cost. And that's what, he's, that's what Paul is talking about here. For us, the finished work of Christ to become, uh, fulfill its goal in people's lives, we need to go forth, we need to deny ourselves, 
We need to take up our cross and follow Jesus. To deny yourself is, self-denial is a type of suffering. Mm. When you don't do what you really want to do. That's right, yeah. And you stop doing what you really want to do. Because Jesus says you can't do it anymore. It's sin. And, and so to, to, to deny yourself requires certain suffering. It's, right. it's a struggle. It's not easy to right. say, no longer I. No longer my will, but Christ will be done. Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't want to there you go. Okay. Oh, Lord, get me back on track. And so that's the sufferings of Christ that are there. I want us to have a look. Because we're looking at Paul's passion. He's willing to suffer. He's willing to pay the price. And, and there's these other words. Um, to sacrifice of himself for others. To sacrifice of himself for the kingdom. That's what he's talking about here, making up in his body in regards to what's lacking in Christ's affliction. And he does it for the sake of the church. So in Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, Galatians 4, 19, and Paul says that uh, he, is, he is suffering and, and he's striving and he's wrestling as in the, the pains of childbirth, like, like a woman in the pains of travail of childbirth, and, the, and, and the, the, there's a pain that a woman goes through to give birth to a child. And, and Paul says, well, I am like that uh, for the church. I'm like this woman, and I'm in the, the pains of the travail of childbirth until Christ is fully formed in you. And so his goal through his preaching, his teaching, his counselling and his prayer for the church, his whole life purpose uh, was to see Christ fully formed in the believers. That, that no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me, that we would start to walk and talk as Jesus, to have a relationship with God the Father as Jesus did. And so Paul, Paul is sharing his passion. He's so passionate about this that he's willing to go through a process like a woman in the travail of childbirth. Um, again, if we look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Verse 17 and 18. It says, Now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If, always look at that word if, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Well, Jesus Christ is the hope of glory in our hearts. That's the seal that God has promised to glorify us. We want to share in the glory of God. Amen? But if you want to share in the glory of God, and again it says somewhere else in the New Testament, it says, you know, if we want to share in the glory of the resurrection... If we want to experience what that means, resurrection power, when we are raised from the dead, we're raised from spiritual death and, and we're overcoming by the power of spiritual life. Well, if we want to experience that type of glory of the resurrection, we have to also experience the sufferings of Christ. And that's the principle of the cross. Again, Jesus says, if you really want to be my disciple, deny yourself, take up your cross. And so what is the cross? Well, the cross is a process... On the first day, Jesus dies. On the second day, he is buried. On the third day, he rises again. I've just described baptism. You know, you go under the water, it says, I die with Christ. When you're under the water, it's like, I'm now buried with Christ. And then when you're raised from the water, I'm now raised with Christ, no longer to live my life. When I go under that water, I'm making a covenant with God. I die to live for myself. I die to myself. I died in my own vision, and I now live for Christ. I live that I would fulfill His purpose, His desire. I live for Him and Him alone. That's what you do when you get baptized. And we have a baptism service coming up in a few weeks' time. And if any of you have not been baptized, please come and see me. And we don't count baby baptism in Lions Royal House of Prayer. Because uh, the faith of a parent doesn't save a child, unfortunately. You need to make a personal decision 
to have Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Saviour. And so if you're baptised as a baby, you know, apart from the fact you've got a clean head or something, um, it does not affect you eternally. It's a commitment maybe for your parents saying we, co we commit our child to the Lord, but you need to have a believer's baptism. Okay, so um, that's where we stand on that issue. But anyway, it says here, If indeed we share in his suffering in order to share in his glory, so we have to make this commitment uh, of self-sacrifice, of laying down our rights to follow him, to fulfill his purpose for our lives. And it goes on, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Now this is how Paul gets his hope. Remember this, don't depart from the hope. Here is the Apostle Paul. He is suffering emotionally and spiritually as he wrestles and struggles in prayer for the church. When he sees people failing or he sees people you know, backsliding, he sees people struggling where they don't need to struggle, and he's wrestling in his spirit and he's wrestling in prayer for them and, and he's spending extra time to counsel them and to help them, and he's making a lot of sacrifice to help them to grow in the Lord. Um, and on top of that, to bring the gospel to people that don't want to hear the gospel. You know, there's riots break out in cities when Paul preaches the gospel. Whole, whole city's going to riot. People start trying to stone him with stones. He gets thrown in prison. He gets beaten with rods and with whips. And he gets imprisoned. Uh, one time he was actually stoned and left for dead. They thought they'd killed him. He was probably knocked unconscious. And then, you know, a few hours later he kind of recovered, got back up. And you know what he did? He walked back into the city to preach the gospel. Um, the Apostle Paul, in pre to preach the gospel, he had to travel uh, over land where there was robbers and thieves and it was dangerous to go to certain places and he had to literally risk his life to get to the go gospel to those places. Uh, so he's a, he was a missionary in the true sense of the word missionary. Um, he had to jump on ships and go to other countries and in those days it was very dangerous to go sea travel and he'd actually been shipwrecked three times. Man, most of us don't even get one time in our life. And so here he is. This is the sufferings he's going through. It wasn't just a, a psychosomatic emotional event. <laughs> I'm feeling depressed today. I'm suffering for Jesus. Like he was literally beaten, imprisoned, left for dead, shipwrecked. Those that would call themselves friends become his enemies. And he says, when I consider all of this suffering that I'm going through, but then I consider the glory of God that's going to be revealed in us, believers. Not just me, but in us. Because it's not just about me, it's for you as well. And I consider the glory of God, the glory of the resurrection, that's going to be revealed in us. And I, and I just meditate upon the power of that glory. All of this suffering I'm going through, doesn't even compare. It's worth it. And see, so he's not focusing on the suffering or the cross. He's focusing on the joy set before him. He's like, wow, if you get a revelation of glory. And some of you heard our testimony in Tibet when we were receiving death threats. And uh, they were threatening to kill, kill me and Yeshi um, if we didn't leave in two weeks' time. And uh, as I was sending these death threats and all these different things happened, they threatened to kill our, uh, my, my wife and child and even broke a window downstairs of our house and different things. And uh, this one night, uh, I was by myself because Shumi and Yeshi had gone back to South Korea to see family, not because of the death threat, but because they already had an air ticket, you know. But um, I'm, I'm in the house by myself and these people have sent an email saying they're going to kill me and that they're watching me and all this sort of stuff. And... They smashed the window downstairs a couple of nights before and you kind of lie in bed at night time and every creak you hear is like, are they coming up the stairs right now? You know, did they come into the house? And and am I going to be alive tomorrow morning? And and you know, and I'm thinking maybe I need to buy a baseball bat just in case they try it or something. And the Lord's rebuked me and said, No, don't look at the weapons of this world. Look at the weapons that I have in the spirit. 
And so I said, okay, I'll pray. And so I just, I'm, on the, I'm on the bed and I'm really worried about my, my daughter and my, my wife. And um, I'm, I'm kind of feeling a bit fearful, to be honest. And I'm praying in tongues. And as I'm praying in tongues, something happens. Deep within my inner man, it starts to shake. There's a heartquake. As the fire of God starts to break out deep within me. And I'm on the bed and I start shaking. My whole body starts shaking like this. And then from the heavens down, the Shekinah glory cloud of God starts to come. So deep within me, the Spirit of God, and on top of me, the Spirit of God's coming down. And it was this consuming, fiery, my whole body was shaking on this bed. I'm thinking, this is bizarre, weird. And it was the most awesome feeling I've ever had because it was this total power. It was fire that doesn't destroy you. It feels good fire. And it was just purifying. And it's full of love. It's full of power. It's full of confidence. And I'm shaking away on the bed. And then the Lord spoke to me and says, because I'm thinking, I hope they come and kill me tonight. Because this is so good. He says, Len, this is just a drop of a drop of a drop of the ocean of the glory that is in store for you in heaven. When you come into my presence, the glory that you're going to move into on the outside and the inside is just going to be so overwhelmingly awesome. But this is just a drop of a drop because he said you couldn't even handle the glory that's coming. And it's like all fear left me. And I'm just thinking, I, I kind of hope that they do kill me tonight because I could go straight into it, you know. became selfish. I stopped thinking about my wife and daughter, you know. But see, this is what Paul is saying. If we can get a revelation of the, the hope of the glory that is going to be revealed in us and through us and to us, Whatever we suffer in life, whatever sacrifice we have to make is worth it. I'm willing to suffer, sacrifice that because God has got an even greater reward for me. God has got something better for me. Even in this life, if we surrender and sacrifice in obedience to God, that He has got something better for us than what we are sacrificing. The problem is we always look at what we're sacrificing as being the most precious, important thing. We don't want to let it go. And you can't receive from God. You know, when I was first called to the mission field, when I was 19 years old, and God had called me to go to Tibet, and I'm overwhelmed by the sacrifice I'm going to have to make. I'm going to leave Australia. I'm going to leave a country that speaks English. I was living on the Sunshine Coast on, on a surfy beach and with really good weather. And I had to go to Tibet, you know, and, and they don't even speak English there, and I don't have friends or family there, and... And I didn't even have the money. I didn't know where is the money going to come from for me to be a missionary anyway. And, um, and I'm struggling through all of these things. And there's certain things I just didn't want to let go of. And they weren't like evil sin things. It wasn't like a drug addiction or alcoholism or pornography or something like that. I'm talking about being with my mum and dad. Staying with my family. I had to sacrifice staying with my family. My family had to go on the altar. I had to sacrifice living in my home country. I had to sacrifice being part of a church that I really enjoyed and I had good fellowship. I had to sacrifice the, um, the security of having a guaranteed income. I had to sacrifice my job. I had to sacrifice a lot of these rights and I had a girlfriend back then and I had to let her go. My wife is pretty happy about that. <laughs> But, but see, the things we need to sacrifice, don't just think of wicked, evil, sinful things. There's things that are good, but they're not God. It's not God's best for you. God has, But you, you hold on. And in the midst of all of this, I was in worship and I was just struggling through surrendering to God. Letting go and letting God. I was so, really struggling to let go. And as I was doing this, it's actually keeping me bound in what... And where God didn't want me to be, and it's stopping me from getting where God wants me to be. And, and in the vision, I see myself with this closed fist, and I'm holding on to this thing. It's so precious, I don't want to let it go. And suddenly, God's hand comes out of heaven. And God's got big hands. Like, these are humongous God hands. And, uh, and here's this humongous big God hand come out of heaven. And God has got this most amazing, glorious, 
precious treasure. That's why not one, but there's multiple treasures with such glory and value. And I'm seeing this. God's got, I'm holding on to this little thing and God's got this huge thing in store for me. But I couldn't let go. And finally, the Lord says, Glenn, a closed fist is a closed heart. If you can't let go, then your heart isn't open to receive what I have for you. And so I, I surrendered. I said, okay, Lord, I give it to you. And as I opened my hand, this dirty rag fell out of my hand. The thing that I considered so precious was just a dirty rag in comparison. You know, like Mike's girlfriend's not a dirty rag. <laughs> you know, but this, 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 the thing is, in comparison to what God has for us, what we hold on to is dirty rags. And so Paul isn't saying, my, my, my present sufferings are really nothing at all. They were pretty bad. He, that was real. He was going through some very hard times. He was really having to pay the price. But he's saying, when I compare it to the glory that's going to be revealed in me, it doesn't even compare. It's worth it. And that revelation gave him such hope and inner strength to continue to endure through the process of making sacrifices and through the oppositions. So let's go back to Colossians chapter 2. He says, I rejoice in what was suffered for you. It could be understood, yes, he rejoices in Christ's suffering for the church. He rejoices in what Christ has done for the church. But also he's rejoicing in the sufferings he has had to go through for their sake. Now this is going beyond just accepting suffering. <laughs> he's actually rejoicing in his sufferings. And it says this in 1 Thessalonians, you know, that we need to count it all, no, sorry, James, we count it all pure joy when we go through trials and testings of various kinds. This is how insane being a Christian is. This is the insanity of the wisdom of God. It says God's wisdom is foolishness to men. Here is the insanity of God's wisdom. We're going through trials and testings and we are suffering and then we count it as pure joy. And we rejoice in the opportunity to be able to suffer for Christ's sake. Again, we're not talking about you suffering because you made wrong decisions. Okay? There's no glory in that. There's no reward. You know, God's not going to say, oh, you're suffering because you know you sinned. Oh, keep suffering for your sin. I'll reward you. No, you don't get rewarded when you suffer for sin. You've got to repent of it. Okay? You've got to get forgiven of it. The only good thing of the suffering of sin that it is it can purify you, that suffering. It makes you start to regret what you've done. That's why God in His love will judge you. It's God's love disciplines, so He teaches us how wicked and evil sin really is. If God didn't love us, He'd let you enjoy your sin. And I just pray that we would not enjoy our sin. So we're going back to Colossians. He says, I have, verse 25, I have become the, a servant of the gospel by the commission that God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The King James says, I've become a minister. When we think about Christian ministers, political ministers, because the word minister for politician is a biblical concept. It's actually, they're supposed to be the servants of the people. And uh, Christian minister, we are, we are the servants of Christ and servants of the church. Okay, so don't treat me though as a servant, you know, going to mow your lawn or something. But dealing with the kingdom and the ministry of the kingdom. And so we are to have a servant heart. So Paul is saying, I have been commissioned by God to be a minister, a servant of this gospel message and to be a servant minister for the church. Now that word uh, commission in the NIV is actually stewardship in the King James. I have received a stewardship. Stewardship is a good word. So what happens is, if I'm a steward over a house, 
I don't own the house. I don't own the treasure in the house. I don't own the people that live in the house. It belongs to the owner of the house. And so God is the owner of all things. Christ is the owner. He's the head of the church. I'm not the head of the church. Okay? But I am a steward under him. Which means I need to be accountable or I will be made accountable for how faithful or how unfaithful I am in the ministry of the gospel. And I want you to know it's not just me. You are all ministers. When you get born again, you have been born again to become a minister of the gospel, a minister to the church, a minister for Jesus Christ. And that ministry God has equipped you with is a responsibility. And you will be held accountable in life. Finally, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There's, there's two different judgment seats. There's the, the great white throne judgment and, and uh, the end of the age judgment that happens. There's one judgment, which is whether it's heaven or hell for you. The other judgment is where believers get judged according to how faithful or how unfaithful they have been and how they live the Christian life. And so we are going to stand under a judgment. doesn't mean you're going to go to hell. But that we're going to be judged by how faithful or how unfaithful we've been. And that's seen in the, in the parable of the talents. There comes a day that we get called before Jesus. Because Jesus is the, the man that goes away to a far country to be made king. He gives us talents. We have to work those talents faithfully as stewards. And then when he returns, because he's been made king, and he returns, he calls us, and we have to give account. And so, you know, what are you going to do? And what is he going to say when you stand before that throne? You know, did you bury your talents? Did you spend your whole life pursuing your own dream? Pursuing your own vision? Pursuing your own goal? Or did you pursue Jesus and the vision and the goal that he had for your life? And have you been faithful? You know, you can be a business person. You can work in a sushi bar. You can be a doctor. But that's your ministry. Do you understand? You don't have to be a full-time pastor. Okay, we couldn't afford it. <laughs> but, the, but wherever you go you can be a school teacher well that is your ministry you have to it says do all things as unto Christ so you are a representative of Jesus Christ as a teacher when you work in the sushi bar your attitude is to represent Jesus to your boss and to the customers and do they see a cranky, unthankful Jesus? Or do they see a really hard-working, good attitude Jesus? You know what I'm saying? Because people, the only Jesus some people are going to see is you. And you're either going to draw them to Jesus by being a good witness, or you're going to push them away going, what a cranky, ugly, bitter Jesus. So, you know, if, 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 if that's what Jesus does for you, I don't want to go to church. So this is something to think about. Let's not just think... I'm not talking about Paul this morning. I'm talking about the example of Paul for us to follow. Paul himself says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. We are commanded in Scripture just to imitate Paul as he is striving in the Spirit to imitate Jesus Christ. So we have received a stewardship. We will be called to account. If you understand that you've not been faithful, now is a good time to have communion. <laughs> you know, now's a good time to say, okay, Lord, where I've not been faithful, I ask for your forgiveness, your grace, because that is counted in the judgment when you when you're fully repented. But part of repentance is change. When you say, okay, I repent, which isn't just saying I'm sorry, I change. I'm, I, I realize I've not been fully faithful as a steward of the gospel. I've not been a good witness. I've been pursuing other goals. And so I repent of that, I cleanse myself of my mistake, and now I move ahead with a new goal and direction. Hallelujah. So I've become a servant of the gospel by the commissioning or the stewardship that God has given me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Now this is very interesting because the King James words this a little bit differently. It says to, um, to fulfill the word of God. 
Instead of presenting the Word of God fully, it says to fully fulfill the Word of God. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to teach both because I believe both are biblical, okay? So this is what the NIV says. The NIV says basically what I said before. I'm oh, sorry, the King James says what I said before. Okay? Jesus Christ and His finished work on the cross, that is the gospel message, the message of Jesus Christ and the Word of God. And so... To fulfill the Word of God, we need to now apply it. And what he's saying as an apostle, as he's preaching, as he's teaching, as he's exhorting, as he's praying for the church, his goal is that the Word of God would be fulfilled in the church. That, 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 that the promises of God would be fulfilled, that the goal and the vision of God would be fulfilled. Do you understand what I'm saying in that? that that's how we are... Fulfilling what Christ has done. And that's what we need to do with that goal as we pray for people, as we encourage people, as we disciple people. And our goal is the Word of God be fulfilled in them. And that the Word of God be fulfilled in us. Now the NIV's way of translating this is basically saying he proclaims the Word of God in its fullness. And it's like in the book of Acts... Paul is speaking to the elders of the church of Ephesus. Paul has raised up these leaders, these elders, and this is his last conversation with them. He, he's, he doesn't think he's going to see them ever again. Actually, he does, but he doesn't think so. At that time, he, he thinks this is my last will and testimony. This is my last word to the elders. And he says to them, beware of wolves, they're coming, and some of you will become wolves. What a prophecy. But like seriously, Bible prophecy, we just wouldn't allow it in most churches today. Wolves are coming. Some of you are going to become wolves. Some of you are going to become false ministers. Then he goes on, he says, I want you to know that when I have been with you, I have not failed to proclaim the word of God in its fullness. Which is what he's is saying here in the NIV. In other words... I have not treated the Word of God as a smorgasbord. Where you go to a smorgasbord and you pick out, you know, we'll go, we'll do it. You know, you, you just pick out the, the yummy stuff that you like. And, you know, our kids go straight to the dessert bar. You know, they want the chocolate ice cream and everything. And we've got to get them to the salad bar to have their vegetables. You know, you cannot have dessert first. You have your vegetables first. Oh, no, your vegetables. Okay, and so... Paul is basically saying, in the Word of God, there are words of God that you will naturally be drawn to. It depends on your personality. I'm weird. I'm a very black and white person. Like, judgment scriptures I love. It's like, wow. <laughs> Jesus, one of my favorite stories is Jesus going through the temple with the whip and smashing tables over and hitting people. Like, yeah, I want to come through the church like that, you know. <laughs> and I'm your pastor, you know, watch out. <laughs> no, but see, because of our personalities, some people are all mercy, mercy people, okay? And so they don't see Jesus Christ smashing tables over and whipping people with a whip and, and rebuking people. They just see Jesus, you know, like the, the, the Jesus with a little lamb over his shoulder and he's just hugging people and patting them. That's their Jesus, okay? But you've got to proclaim Jesus in his fullness. Because Jesus, who will protect the little lamb, will grab his rod and his staff, and he will smash that wolf to protect the lamb. And by the way, when the little lamb is being naughty, when I was in Tibet, I hung out with shepherds. When little lambs are naughty and they're wandering away, they get their sling. Smack him in the head. And the little lamb turns around and comes back. That's what the hook and the crook. The hook is actually for the naughty lamb. You come to the lamb, you smack him, and you hook him around the neck, and you pull him back. Okay? See, but the thing is, that the fullness of the Word of God. So we have to understand, we don't just want Jesus smashing through the church with a whip. Amen? <laughs> we want Jesus coming along and hugging you when you need a hug, and encouraging you when you need an encouragement. But this is an important thing. Know yourself. Know your personality. Because each one of us will have a Jesus that's formed and fashioned after our own image. 
You've been created in the image of God. To reflect His image, to reflect His glory. Jesus Christ, it says in Colossians, is the fullness of the image of God. Amen? Jesus isn't just half. He's not just the, he's not just the mercy, grace Jesus. He's the holiness, righteousness judge. He's not just full of grace, He's full of truth and grace. And so this is what it's saying here is, okay, understand who you are. Understand that you're naturally drawn to certain parts of the revelation of Jesus. And then what you need to do is you need to search the fullness. And that's why we have a body where we speak into one another's lives and, we, and you get a balance from the fullness. Because if, if you get grace and mercy without law and judgment, you get license to sin. And then you, you just say to a homosexual, you can continue doing what you're doing. Jesus loves you. It's okay. Now, if you really love a homosexual, you say, repent, or you're going to go to hell. You can hug them. Jesus loves you. He doesn't want you to go to hell. But you can't go to hell with your sin, just like any one of us. So that's what it's saying here. Paul, as a minister, this is part of his stewardship, and we need the fear of God over us in doing this. We need to proclaim the Word of God in its fullness. Who is Jesus in his fullness? And we study scripture, and we, we like to do that at Lions Raw. You study the names and the titles of Jesus. Yes, he is mercy. Yes, he is love. Yes, he is compassion. Yes, he is a good shepherd. But he's also the judge. He's the king. He's the Lord. He's the master. And we need to understand that fullness to get a balance. Uh, it's the love of God in the fear of the Lord. And the fear of God and the love of the Lord. It says, he has, to com he has to present the Word of God in its fullness. This is the mystery that has been hidden for ages and generations. But it's now disclosed to the saints. This word mystery was used by the cults. The Greek Gnostic cults. The word occult means hidden. So cults work with hiddenness. And it's only a very small selected group of people have the understanding of the truth. Jesus said, when I, whatever I say to you in secret, you must proclaim from the rooftops. In other words, Jesus is saying, my message is not to be kept secret. It's to be proclaimed to everybody. Okay, And you've got to understand that this word mystery in the Greek is used by the cults. But then what Paul is saying, Jesus is the mystery of God. And the fullness of everything has been revealed to the saints or to the church. It's not a hidden thing anymore. It's been, it was hidden in the past. In the Old Testament, they, they knew the Messiah is coming, but they didn't know all the fullness of Jesus. But now we know. Jesus is the mystery. Um, a number of years ago, when we first started Lions Roar, uh, there, there is a cult, and it's a, a Korean group in, in Brisbane, and uh, this cult would infiltrate different churches. And uh, they were running Bible study times. So it doesn't, it sounds pretty biblical, you know, Bible study times, come to our Bible study. So what they would do is they'd infiltrate all of these different churches. And then they start to encourage them to come to their private Bible study. They didn't try to get people to leave the church. They send their people into the church. We had one of them join our, our, our group. And we knew who she was. We just kept an eye on her. Um, and uh, that group, the way that they'd work was this. They said, as you study scripture, there is actually these secret patterns. As you study, you'll find there's these secret patterns in how scriptures work. And it's like a, a secret key. And the more you study scripture, and God will give to some people revelation of the mystery, and they'll understand the secret key. And these are the ones that are truly saved. And they'll have all of these questions, do you understand this? And do you understand this? And do you understand this? If you don't understand, you don't have the knowledge. Because the, the Gnostics, the name Gnostic means knowledge. And they said there's secret hidden knowledge that only a certain few can have. So that's what this, this cult was. So these cults are running around today. 
And you know, the, the Jehovah Witnesses with their 144,000, there's only really 144,000 that make it in. And, and so you talk to most Jehovah Witnesses, do, you know, they have no assurance of faith. I, I might not be, I don't even know if I'm saved. I might not be a saved one. Well, the whole message of the gospel is you can in this life have full assurance of faith if you fully embrace Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. You don't have to pass a theological degree. If you have to pass, because the thing is, there's a lot of things theologically that people can be wrong in, but if Jesus is their Lord and Saviour and they understand the cross, they're saved. Uh, they might have some error, but we need an assurance. You can have a full assurance that you are saved and you're going to heaven. But the cults bring out there's a secret group, and only the secret group knows the secret things, and you never know if you're in. You never know if you're really saved. That's a mark of a cult. Either that or you're not really saved and you need to get saved. Because Jesus talked about the people that said, Lord, Lord, and he said, I never knew you. So there is that place. But if you fully know the gospel, and, and it's not in your works that you have faith, it's, it's not in your knowledge of understanding secret things, but it's in Christ and Christ alone, which is the message of Colossians, you have salvation. Okay? So this mystery is revealed in the message of Jesus Christ. It was hidden in ages past, but now it's been disclosed to the saints. It's been revealed to the saints. Verse 27, to them God has chosen to make it known. Again, the emphasis is this is not a hidden secret. This is something that is publicly made known. And it's made known not just to the Jews. This is part of the mystery. It's made known to the Gentiles. So all of, the, all of us people that aren't Jews here can really celebrate, which makes just about everybody. See, the Jews got offended that the Messiah came not just for them, but Messiah came from, for every tribe, nation, and tongue. If you study the New Testament, there's this struggle. One of the struggles was the Judaizers who were in Colossae. We've already seen that. The two heresy groups. One was the Judaizers. These were the Jews that had become Christians that were trying to make the Christians into little Jews. Saying, we need to celebrate Passover. We need to, we need to worship on the Sabbath day. You know, and you need to circumcise your sons. And in other words, you've got to come under the Jewish law and the Jewish feasts and festivals in order to be a real Christian. That's a heresy. It's okay for you to celebrate Passover. We have a freedom to celebrate or not to celebrate. You can worship on Saturday if you want. You have freedom to worship or not to worship. But you don't have a, a freedom to say, if someone goes to church on Sunday, they are not a true Christian. You don't have a right to say, because they don't celebrate the Sabbath or they don't celebrate the Jewish festival, that they're not a true believer. That's heresy. So that was one group that was out there. They're called the Judaizers. And they're dealt with in the book of Colossians. We'll look at that later. The other group's the Gnostics, and they're coming with all of the pagan, occult, Greek thinking. And they're coming in. So there's this mix of things going on. But the Jews, um, even the Christians, those that received Jesus as their Lord and Saviour, they really got upset that Jesus died for the Gentiles also. That a, that a Roman or a Greek or an Arabian, they don't have to become little Jews. They don't have to follow the Jewish law. They, they found this very, very frustrating. So actually false teachers rose up. And they were the Judaizer teachers. <clears throat> so this is part of the mystery that Israel didn't fully understand. Jesus is coming for every tribe, nation and tongue. He will not just be the saviour of Israel. He's the saviour of the world. It says, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Which I've already shared that. This is the mystery. It's, it's, it's actually, it's not knowing a formula to get saved. It's not knowing a key secret to get saved. It's knowing the person of Jesus Christ. It's relationship. And as we, you know, when we study, this is not ultimately the Word of God. This is a book with ink on it. Okay, this is a scripture. I really value this book. 
But that's not ultimately the Word of God. The Word of God is Jesus the person. And so when I study this book, I'm on a search, not for understanding of the words alone. I'm actually I'm seeking a man who's hidden in this book. And I'm seeking for him, the true God-man Jesus, to speak to me through this book. I want a relationship with him. As I often say, don't so much seek the word of the Lord. Seek the Lord of the Word. That's the key. And, uh, and so these mysteries were so much they're focused on, you have to understand this secret formula. And Paul's saying, no, salvation is through the person of Jesus Christ. It's by entering relationship with Him because of what He's done. He is the wisdom of God. He is the mystery of God. He's the key to the understanding of the knowledge of God. Um, and if you don't have a relationship with Him, don't expect to understand the mysteries of God through this book. Jesus in you, the hope of glory. So He says, we proclaim Jesus. We admonish. And admonish is like when you come and you, you counsel people, but... You, you, you kind of, not so much rebuking them, but you're, you're admonishing them and saying you need to do what is right. You're urging them and you're pleading with them to do that which is right. He says, I'm pleading with you to walk in the ways of Jesus. I'm pleading with you to live a life that honors and pleases Him. And so I'm admonishing you in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm teaching you. Um, and it's with all the wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ Jesus. That's his goal. Remember the goals? Mm. To present everyone perfect in Christ Jesus. So that Christ Jesus would be formed and fashioned in you. If we go back to verse 22, it says here, Reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death in order to present you. Jesus dying on the cross had a purpose. It's to present you as holy in the sight of God, without blemish, and free from all the accusation of the evil one. Verse 22. Jesus' goal and Paul's goal in preaching Jesus is so that you, the people of God, can be fully holy people. Holy unto the Lord. That's what a saint means. Saint means holy one. So that you would be holy, that you would be without sin, that you would be pure, and that you would be without accusation, that Satan could have no legal right to bring any accusation. He said, I'm preaching, I'm teaching, I'm encouraging, I'm challenging you, so that there's no accusation of the devil that can actually come against you. That you'll be free from the powers of darkness, that you'll be free from the curse, and that you'll walk in the fullness of who Christ is, the fullness of His authority, the fullness of His heart, His compassion, His love, His character. That's what I'm preaching. I want us to become like this man, this God-man Jesus. You know, they say you become like the people you hang out with. This is why we have to preach Jesus in His fullness, because Jesus created in our own image the part of Jesus that we naturally like, and the part of Jesus we don't naturally like is, I don't like that verse. Oh, I don't like that. I remember talking to a friend uh, who was part of a ministry in America that was there very much into the Word of God and studying it in its fullness. And they had concern about a very popular Christian movement. I won't name movements at the moment. Very popular Christian movement that is really popular here in Australia internationally. And everyone flocks to their conferences, okay? But they had a concern because they were so much focusing on healing, so much focusing on the good things of Scripture, but they, 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 they basically are saying that everyone gets healed. And uh, we know, by the way, everyone will get healed, if not in this life, in the life to come. But they're saying, no, um, it's God's will that everyone would be healed now. And so these people went to see the leader, and they had a lot of scripture. And they said, well, what about this scripture? That there are times when God has other ways. God doesn't heal because actually through the sickness, God is doing something in the person's life, like humbling them or building their character. And sometimes it's like... God's not delivering you out of your tribulation, but He's going to deliver you through 
And so they had a lot of scriptures, and they said, what about this scripture? And you know what the answer of this really popular uh, preacher is? We don't look at those scriptures. We only look at all the scriptures that support that, that God always wants to heal. We want to focus as a community in our stream on, on that He always heals. And so we don't look at those scriptures. That's like, well, we don't want the wisdom of God. You know, what about the wisdom of God for those people that aren't getting healed in their movement? Understanding God is doing other things. God can accomplish something through sickness. God can even accomplish something through the devil's attack. And if we understand the ways of God, there's a greater fullness. Okay? Verse 29, Paul says, To this end, I labor, struggling with all of this energy that so powerfully works in me, or all of His energy that works so powerfully in me. And this morning I had that scripture, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. And Paul is saying he doesn't labor, he doesn't struggle with all of his own energy. He struggles with all of the energy of God the Father released through Jesus Christ. He says, oh, it's, it's God working in me and through me by the power of the Spirit. I am striving in the Spirit. I am wrestling in the Spirit. It's by the power of God I do this, not in my own strength. I can't do this in my own strength. Uh, this is a very important thing. The word struggling in the Greek is argonisme. Argonisme. Now, argon is the name of the arena. You know, where the gladiators battled out with one another and the gladiators bailed, battled out with all the wild beasts, you know, the bears and the tigers and the lions. And you see these gladiators come and fight the lion and, and everyone sits back and in the arena and they're watching this gladiator and, and they, the gladiators fight other gladiators. The arena is a place of conflict, and a place of contest and, and wrestling against wild beasts. And, and Paul even says in Ephesus he had to fight the wild beasts. It's not talking about... Lions and tigers, Paul had to wrestle demonic spirits. To bring the gospel forward, there was demonic opposition. And Paul says the intensity of spiritual warfare was like, I am wrestling literal wild beasts and wild animals. And those wild animals were manifesting through people. But I had to remind myself, Ephesians 6, I'm not fighting the people. I'm not fighting flesh and blood. I'm fighting demonic powers. That's where the real enemy is. It's not the people. And so... Paul is saying here that as he strives in the Spirit, he's entered this arena of battle. Again, in the book of Romans, he says, I urge you by the mercies of God, join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Again, that word struggle, argon is a man. Paul's saying, here I am in Rome or wherever. He's actually writing to the Romans. So when he was in Corinth, and he's battling the demons in Corinth to see the gospel proclaimed. There's all of this opposition through people happening. And Paul says, you in Rome can join me in my arena of battle by praying to God for me. That in the spirit, even though you're not in the same city, but in the spirit, your spirit through prayer, intercession and spiritual warfare can join me in my battle. And then your prayers join me and empower me to overcome and have victory in my arena. How's that? Well, that is going to be our message next Sunday. We're going to look because he's, he starts to talk about this battle, this arena that he's involved in. And we're going to look at that next Sunday. So Heavenly Father, we just come before you and we do ask that you would place within our hearts the very passion, the zeal, the burden, the fire that was burning in the heart of the Apostle Paul to be your minister and a minister towards the church. And more than that, Lord, the, the very fire that burned in the heart of Jesus, the very passion, we need that spirit. We need your power to work powerfully in us. We need your spirit to work powerfully in us. Lord, we cannot be victorious. We cannot overcome in our own strength. 
So we humbly come before you this morning. We cry out. Amen. Holy Spirit, fill us with the strength and the power and the energy of God. Amen. That you empower us with the hope of God. That you empower us with the love of God. That you empower us with the wisdom of God, Lord. Lord, that a holy fire would burn in us, would burn away the dross. We are willing, Lord, but we need you. We need Jesus to join us and we need to join Jesus. We cannot do the ministry of the gospel without you and a relationship with you. We need you to minister in us and through us, Lord. We acknowledge that. It's a person. It's a relationship. It's not an ideology or an idea. So come, Lord Jesus, by your Spirit. Fill us as you did Paul. Fill us as you did Elijah. That we would be exceedingly zealous for our God. Amen. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.